Welcome to the podcast. We're street smart, business smart, all kinds of smart people share their insights into the world of marketing, career journeys, and personal growth. So sit back and prepare to get enlightened with your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Tribe, my guest today, Lars Schmidt, is the founder of Amplify and host of the awesome 21st Century HR podcast. He's also the co-founder of HR Open Source, and he spent 20 years in HR and recruiting, building talent strategies for a broad range of companies and industries. He's a writer with regular columns covering the future of work in Fast Company and Forbes and co-author of Employer Branding for Dummies. There's a yellow cover, right? And a global speaker and recently back from Australia and a ton of other world journeys that we're certainly going to talk about. And I first met Lars uh, via Hung Lee's Recruiting Brain Food um, podcast a few few months ago. We connected on a call. We talked shop. And I met him this this past September in Dallas at LinkedIn Connect. We had an awesome uh, experience together. This dude has an awesome rig for his phone, which I was like totally <laughs> fanboying after. I think I'm, I'm moving on to that now with my LinkedIn live. We hit it off. This guy brings a ton of value and I knew I had to bring him to my audience. Lars Schmidt, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, man. Thanks to have me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. So let's start off quickly um, with a little introduction to my tribe. I, I, I hopefully didn't miss anything in the intro, but I'm going to ask you what I ask a lot of my <laughs> candidates. Yeah. Tell me who you are and what you do best, man. Yeah, who I am? Well, I'm I'm a dad. Uh, I've got uh, two uh, amazing uh, daughters and a and a great wife. I'm based uh, outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia. Uh, been in this space for about 20 years. Uh, most of that has been on the corporate side. So ran uh, global recruiting and HR teams at Ticketmaster and uh, Magento, and most recently NPR, kind of leading them through their digital transformation. And uh, about six years ago, I left uh, the corporate world to start my own firm, Amplify. And so what I do now is a mix of uh, strategic consulting in the areas of uh, employer brand strategy and recruiting optimization, and uh, also HR executive search. That's, so that, that, is, uh, that is my day job. And uh, as you it. mentioned, that's an embarrassingly long bio. I do some writing and speaking and uh, podcasting as well. So Yeah, it's awesome, man. I'm really glad that we connected. I find a lot of uh, parallels and, and synergies in the work that we're doing um, and, and, and following along. So you know, we talk a lot about the future of work as some far off concept, and it's a buzzword and people are talking about it. But the reality is, it's, it's here. The, the future is now. So in your opinion, when people throw this word around, what does the future of work mean to you? And what should it mean to everybody else? Uh, well, what, I think people that throw it around are lazy. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's now. It. Like we've been talking about the future of work for 10 years, right? And so we can't have an infinite horizon. And I think it's uh, using that term as if it's this far off uh, point in time is misleading. It's doing the industry a disservice. Like let's work in the now. The now is already the future. Like it's very complex. Uh, it's ever changing. And I think it's really important that practitioners uh, are really kind of uh, working with their head up and, you know, not just kind of not paying attention to the future work or this idea that it's the future and it's not here yet. It's here now. You need to adapt. You need to adjust. Uh, you need to pay attention to what's going on around you. And, uh, and I think that's, that's generally how I, I frame it. And, and again, that, this idea of the future, like we're going to be getting hit year after year with more change more, you know, innovation. I, I kick myself every time I use the word disruption, but sometimes it fits, yeah. you know. Sometimes more. it works. It's a, it, it's a meaning, right? Yeah, it does. So I think, uh, you know, that, that's, that's just not going to change. That's just going to be constant for practitioners uh, these days. And, and that's, that's the new normal. We have to adjust to it. That's really interesting. I mean, going back to, to your, your core business model, executive search in that, in, in that HR world, what is really separating, you know, true HR leaders? Like when companies are hiring HR leaders, what are, what are a couple of those core golden nuggets that they're looking for you to find in, in those candidates? Yeah, I mean, so my, the space that I work in when it comes to search is entirely around kind of what I frame as next generation HR. So I use the term 21st century HR. You could use the term modern HR, however you want to frame it. Um, but you know, there, there's a very big you know, delta between legacy HR and modern HR. And 100%. I'm not at all interested in the legacy side. I only want to operate on the modern side. I want to work with companies that are trying to build those kind of people capabilities. I want to work with HR leaders have practiced that kind of HR. And so I think what they're typically looking for, one of the biggest distinctions, uh, you know, modern HR executives are business operators. 
first and foremost. They have a deep business acumen that rivals all of their executive peers. Mm -hmm. They just focus on people, uh, right? And so I think that you're, you, that's why you're starting to see the profile really evolve. You're seeing more people in a CPO or chief people officer or a CHO role that are coming from other areas of the business because they bring that business acumen and they apply that to people challenges. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at someone like Claude Silver, for example, you know, chief heart officer at VaynerMedia. I mean, she came from an account services background, not even an HR background, because she's bringing that people centric uh, approach and then combining it with the understanding of account management and really understanding how to run that business. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the, the legacy HR of HR being an outs, you know, a, a, just a function like hiring, firing benefits, that's over. Yeah. That, that, that day, that day is, in, is over. Um, so what are some companies, I mean, we don't have to call any names here, but what are some best practices that you're seeing from these companies where they're really embracing HR as a core function uh, versus being like a, a resource? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, pick any high-performing company uh, right now, and they, you know, they will all have a people team that is foundational to their success, and they view it that way. And I think that you know, if you look at the evolution of HR, you know, legacy HR embraced a very much a command and control mindset, and they did that because they felt it was a path to power. So right. you know, if we can make HR be the bottleneck, the approver, the gateway through which things have to happen. That then gives us clout, that gives us power. Uh, the opposite was the reality. You know, employees and managers and executives got really frustrated because there's so much bureaucracy and process where they didn't need to be. If you look at modern HR, it's very different. You know, the, the modern HR leaders, they're, they're trying to create a frameworks that really um, you know, decentralize the scope of responsibility so that employees are empowered to do their best work. Managers are empowered to manage. Leaders are, are you know, given the tools they need to lead. Everything doesn't have to go through HR and it shouldn't. And it's deliberately not, you know, in those organizations. So they can yeah, be more nimble and, and, you know, HR becomes a, a success enablement to the business and to the employees as opposed to, uh, you know, land of uh, bureaucracy. Yeah. And it's interesting too. And I think another fundamental shift and kind of my, my slight riff on that also, it's a fundamental sh change of where HR has never been perceived as a profit generating center. And it's been deprioritized within organizations. The mindset flip is when companies realize, hey, your people are your profit, or your people are first. They're the ones who are generating. They're the most important thing. I mean, that is your commodity. Yeah. That is your asset, your people. And then once you make that fundamental shift and prioritize HR, talent, recruiting, it's a game changer. And then they're really truing this, seeing the true bottom line increase. Yeah, well, I think a lot of companies, you know, all companies, you know, they, they like to say our people are our greatest strength, right? That's like a tired uh, yep. mantra that a lot of companies like, okay, so don't tell me, show me. Like, what are you, what are you doing to actually empower them? How, what, are you, what systems are you putting in place so that they can thrive, so they can be developed, so that they can build their own skills, so that will be valuable to them while they're working for you and beyond, yep, uh, yep, right? Absolutely. And I think that, that it's, it's, a, it's a shift in mindset around really creating programs that empower the employees to do their best work. Um, and again, that's, you know, one of a variety of things that I think are, are usually kind of, uh, you know, pegged to, to modern HR as opposed to legacy practices. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so speaking of modern HR, I mean, you built a foundation as a tech recruiter in the dot-com 1.0. Some of us still remember that, right? In the late 90s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and major tech companies. And you saw firsthand the rise and fall. What do you see as a number one key innovation in the tech side of talent and HR, um, you know, in the past few years? Uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm bullish on the potential of AI, but we're not there yet and we won't be there for a little while. So, you know, that's not a, a really a fair answer to your question because that's not a developed thing. I think that'll be, as we get more into the middle stages of this next decade, I think it'll become more mainstream. Um, so I think, you know, when you look at, at leaps and bounds innovation, uh, you know, we, we tend to iterate right? We, we don't have reinvention for the most part. And this is broadly across, you know, HR, recruiting, talent, et cetera. So like our ATSs have gotten better. Our tools have gotten better. Our sourcing tools have gotten much better. You know, now I think that's probably, you know, that, that may even be one of the biggest changes is like mm -hmm. now we have tools like HireTool and others that can help us identify emails and find candidates and create yep. like profiles. And so the ability to tap into that uh, is massive. That's a, that's a game changer because, you know, the challenge with recruiting in today's market is it's never been easier to find people. It's never been harder to ca capture their attention. And yeah. And the noise. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that was kind of leading me to my next point here. I mean, are we losing touch with that 
that human experience. I mean, I, I, I was trained by an old school recruiter before LinkedIn, before like they were literally fax machines for resumes. Yeah. You would actually have to talk to somebody. You would actually have to talk to a candidate and really understand their motives and, and you know, what they're looking for in their, in their job and their life. Do you think we're losing touch with all this technology with that human experience? I mean, I, I actually don't think so. I think the technology is going to replace some of the, you know, manual, um, low, you know, IQ, EQ tasks that humans don't really need to be doing. And, and, and with that, give us more time to do more of the higher touch uh, relational things that machines can't do. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I had um, a gentleman by the name of Drew Austin on my show a couple of weeks ago. He created a company called Wade and Wendy, which is really interesting, innovating the, I, the, uh, the AI piece within recruiting where it's, it's a lot of tech roles that they do, but they basically have the chat bot and, and, the, and the candidate knows this. And the chat bot is taking in a lot of that intake information, that very linear black and white kind of information, yeah. sponsorship, salary requirements, all that kind of fun stuff. And it's actually enabled the recruiter. You basically get your cheat sheet and the recruiter now has a step ahead, right? You're, you have more time to engage with that candidate on the important stuff. And that's where I really see some of this uh, real true innovation happening um, you know, you know, in this space. So I think we're moving in the right direction. So let's move on to, I want to talk a little bit about employer branding. It's another buzz category word that gets thrown around a lot, but why is it so important? Why should brands really be cognizant of how they're being viewed in the marketplace from a candidate perspective? Because you have an employer brand, whether you consciously craft it or not. Right. And so you can either help shape that discussion and that conversation and that perception of you as an employer, or you can be at the mercy of Glassdoor and whatever other tools are out there. Yeah. You know, I, I, think, I think you can't you know, avoid uh, addressing employer brand at your own peril, I think in general. And you don't have to go crazy. Like there's some companies that uh, they're all in and they've got internal agencies and studios that are developing content. And you know, that's, that's great if you're in that position, but, uh, but to, there's lots yeah. of things that you can do that are, that are uh, you know, low, effort uh, and, you know, but still reasonable impact. But I, I don't think any company can be in the luxury of, of not having any consciousness or awareness about, you know, what their employee is and, and, and any effort on shaping it. I think that's a real miss for companies that, uh, that aren't thinking about that on any level. Yeah. And, and that goes hand in hand with the candidate experience. And something that I preach to a lot of my clients is your internal recruiter team is the first they are the brand ambassador to your company of any potential new employee. And that experience yeah. is critical, right? I mean, you have a negative candidate experience. Someone takes a job. That's a bad taste in their mouth um, to start. So what are some things that you've seen from the recruitment perspective when working with some in-house companies that are doing really well? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're right. I mean, the recruiters are the primary brand ambassadors of the organization. They're out there talking to candidates every single day. And so the, the interaction they're having, the impression they're leaving uh, is is formative in shaping the view of what that place is like to work for. So, um, I, you know, candidate experience is something we've been talking about for a long time. You know, some companies take it seriously. Uh, most companies don't. And that shows, I think that there's a lot of easy ways that you can, I mean, one of my favorite hacks around candidate experience um, is basically saying like, as a recruiting, as a recruiter and as an organization, you typically know the kinds of questions the candidates are going to have about your interview process. You know, like, what is the review process like? How long will it be until I hear back? Uh, what is the uh, interview process like? And, and you know, what, maybe what benefits do you have? And so, I, you know, low, easy hack, I generally recommend, you know, no matter what your ATS is, or even if you're having people email a mailbox, you can just set up an auto response and basically create a FAQs around what's it like to, so you know, easy. what's your interview process like? It's so easy. So you, you create it one time, you set it and forget it. And boom, now anybody who's applying is immediately getting, you know, the 90% of the questions that they probably have answered proactively. And it's a great touch. And you can, you know, coming back to employer brand, you could also include other things in there. Like in the meantime, you know, here's our careers, you know, Twitter feed, here's our LinkedIn life page, here's an employee blog. Yeah, give them all have. the resources, give them all the yeah. links, make it, make make it, it easy, easy make it easy for them. And it also enables you to have more time with the candidate talking about other things. Like say you're only limited to a half hour, you know, time slot to talk to a candidate. You could take away 20, 20 minutes of that by having the information to them before you even engage with them the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, that's, you know, there, there's, there's no investment in that. That's time. That's a couple of hours yeah. uh, in a day, maybe a day. Yeah, and it's, and, it's it, so and it has it. a big impact. So yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. So I want to switch a little bit to the candidate side. I mean, you, you are a recruiter by trade. It's in your blood. I mean, we're yep. branded with it. Um, and, you know, we're getting a, it's a tough industry, right? It's like lawyers, right? Like it's those bad ones that give the good ones a, you know, a bad name and it's tough for us too. Um, and, I, and I applaud you because I think that the work that we're doing by putting our voice out there and, and I can only assume how amazing you are with your, with your candidates. Is there, you know, a couple of questions when you're coaching a candidate before they go into the interview process, mm -hmm. right? Are, you, are there, is there, is there a couple of litmus test questions that you guide them to ask for them to really ensure that a job is right for them or a culture is right for an organization that they're about to join? Yeah. I mean, ideally I've done that before the interview, right? That's kind of my role. So my, all my recruiting tends to be, uh, right, you know, it's all yeah. executive search, like at the, the CPO and CHR level. And so usually there's a lot of those conversations before even um, submitting, you know, to a, uh, to a candidate so that the, so that, that initial alignment's there. I think in terms of prepping for the interview, um, I want, you know, I want to take away any surprises as best I can. So, you know, here's the team, here's what they're looking for. Um, here's what they say they're looking for. Here's me reading between the lines of what I think that they yep. really need the based on where they are. So like the more ammo I can give them and the more information I can give them going into that meeting to prepare them, um, the better they're going to be able to be themselves and be uh, comfortable and confident and then allow the client to get a gauge of like, is this, is this skill set? Is this demeanor? Is this uh, approach philosophically, however wise, is that aligned with what we, what we want? And so, you know, and that's, that's on both sides and the client side as well, try and also prep them on the candidate. You know, here's a background, here's what they've done. Here's what they want to do. Here's their strengths. Um, you know, here's areas where they don't go as deep and they'll probably need to build a team around them. So again, kind of you know, my role in that is really on both sides of that connection, you know, really prepping them each um, to get the most out of those conversations. Yeah, that's fantastic. So let me, <laughs> this is a fun little question here. You have a, a new recruiter working for you, day one. What is that golden piece of advice you would give that new recruiter to be successful in our industry? Build a good name. Build a good name, yeah. Your Repet name is everything in recruiting. Repetition. I mean, this isn't, this isn't just recruiting, but you know, if you are, Life. you, yeah, like you, if you are, you know, if you're, if you're one of those recruiters, right, who leaves people hanging, who uh, isn't honest, who doesn't have integrity, uh, you can't shake that. That's going to follow you wherever Absolutely. you go. And, and that's going to, you know, ultimately that's going to hinder your career. And so do the right thing, build a good name, be helpful, add value, right? Uh, the, the more you do that, even when you're learning, like you, you may think, uh, I'm learning, what value do I have to add? Everybody has value to add and, and take that approach. We're like, exactly. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to be helpful? How am I going to, uh, you know, be a resource? I think if you do that and you build a good name, you know, that's the foundation of your career and good things will come from it. That's awesome. So let's talk about Amplify. You know, it's a new model of HR executive search. How is it different than what's been done in the past? So when I launched Amplify you know, six years ago, I was initially, the first five years were mostly focused on consulting. Um, I did a little bit of executive search here and there, but it wasn't really a focus. Um, and so that changed earlier this year when I launched the executive search practice uh, for HR leaders. The differentiator is, you know, when I set about to build that, I didn't want to build an executive search firm. And what I mean by that is, you know, most executive search firms, um, they're transactional, they're binary, and uh, the utility is, you know, a couple times in your career when you're making a move. And I don't operate like that on, on any level. You know, for me, I'm more about building guy. communities. I'm, build, I'm about the long game. I'm about building ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do is to build a, a global ecosystem of modern CHROs and CPOs and heads of people and connect them together. So in the most models of a search, you know, an agent has their, you know, their Rolodex, so to speak, and they'll have their one-to-one -one relationships with, you know, lots of different talent. Um, I have those one-to-one -one relationships, but I want to add more value to them. So I want to connect them with each other. And so that's the ecosystem model. It's not just me um, having these relationships. It's me building these relationships and then using them to bring others together and help them broaden their networks, um, excel, accelerate and develop their own career. And so that's really the big differentiator. I think the other piece is, uh, because Amplify is a boutique, it's just me, um, you're working with me every step of the way. You know, it's not like a larger firm where you've got search teams and handoffs. You're not and farming you might, it out. Yeah, you're the one doing yeah. it. You're, the, you're doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat. As you know, you know, with bigger firms, uh, you know, they, they have you know, teams, they have sourcers, they have account reps, they have, and so you might, uh, you know, really connect with a partner and say, you know, this person yeah, gets it, they get the industry, they get the space, and you sign the deal you don't see them anymore, right? Then it's like everybody on their team. And that's, that's their value, a bait and switch. 
Yeah, but how do we scale? Like, I'm going through the same thing, right? Like, my, yeah. my firm's a boutique firm. There's a couple of us here. And when, when a client signs on with me, they're getting me. Yeah. I mean, I have resources, I have support, but you're getting me. I'm the one talking to every single candidate. But how do, how do we scale that? Like, how do we scale that in a comfort zone or do we not scale it, right? Like, I'm kind of fighting this thing right now where, yes, I, I, I'm in a position where I, where I want to scale, yeah. but I need to keep true to my core service and offering, which, like you, is us. It's me. Yeah. We are the product. Yeah. I mean, that's a choice to make. I mean, for me, uh, I've made the conscious choice not to scale. Uh, Amplify is just going to be me. It's a boutique. Uh, it, it, Thinking about that. It's an environment that uh, it allows me to be. And like I said, when you asked me who I am and what I do, my first answer was dad. And, and I want, you know, my, my ideal scenario and kind of why I do this is I want to create a work construct that allows me to prioritize being a dad and prioritize family and have that flexibility. Once you scale, it becomes something else. And again, no, that's for some people, that's what they want. And that's great. But for me personally, I, I've had those opportunities. I've turned them down um, because for me, it's the, you know, the lifestyle, the, the flexibility, the ability to make, be the sole decision maker and, and you know, know every aspect of the business and bandwidth and, and all the things that I need. Um, that to me is more important than scaling and chasing a few more dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, like the structure that I have now is what works yeah, I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, once I launched my own business, I because I, mean, I never had this before, but like I, I created the lifestyle that I've always wanted. I mean, financially, I'm doing very well, more than I've ever, ever done. But it's that time and the flexibility to be there for my kids, to be at my, my kids' you know, concerts and dance events and spend time with my, my one and a half year old. And that's the game changer. Yeah. Right. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm going back to what you said, like making that conscious decision not to scale. Yep, and, that, and that's kind of where I'm at right now, and I'm, I'm still I'm good where I'm at right now, man. And I think I'm a, I'm being more cautious about the opportunities that come my way, knowing what I've created and how much I value that. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is like once you, especially when you go from a solopreneur to uh, to you know you have people working for you, it becomes something else, right? And like that and again, I'm not placing judgment on whether that's good or of bad. Course. It's an individual decision, but it's, it's just it's a different thing. And so it really have to think about what your drivers are. And what's important to you and for, for me and what I want to build. And again, I, I have this, uh, this role and I've created this, this, you know, kind of portfolio career, if you will, where it's like, I want to, I want to do writing. I want to do podcasting. I want to do speaking. I want to write a book. I want to mm-hmm. you know, do consulting work. Mm-hmm. I want to be a dad. It's like, there, I have all these things that I want to do. And, and the structure of me, um, you know, being a company of one allows me the ability, awesome. ability to do all those things. Yeah, and it's awesome. And, I, and I, dude, I've seen you in action, man. You're a fantastic moderator. You're a great podcast host. Let's talk about the podcast, 21st Century Podcast, HR Podcast. And you can't see it now, but I actually have your sticker on the back of my <laughs> computer here. And that actually inspired me. I, I, I now have my own stickers. Nice. Which is awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll get you one of those next time I see you. But let's talk about your podcast. It's awesome. Yeah. You, the caliber and level of guests that you have are incredible. So let's give our audience a little, a little sneak peek. Tell us a little bit about the purpose of your show, the type of guests that you're having, and what the value you want to bring to your listeners. Yeah, I mean, so the show, uh, I launched the show in February. Initially, uh, it was tied to a Fast Company series I'm working on this year called 21st Century HR. So what I wanted to do with the podcast when I launched it was to create a platform where I could basically, um, for every piece that I wrote in Fast Company, I could do a podcast on that topic and embed it in the article. So if a reader wanted to go deeper, I mean, there's only so much context you can give in a thousand words. So if a reader wanted to go deeper, they'd have that opportunity. Um, once that was established, you know, my, my writing cadence is usually uh, monthly, uh, and I wanted to do a podcast more frequently. There's a lot of other stories I wanted to dig into. And so then the podcast really evolved to be a, uh, a weekly show where I would uh, interview uh, CHROs, CPOs, CEOs who are building modern people teams and modern capabilities. And, and there's a couple things I wanted to do there. One was to really illuminate the career path of a modern CPO, right? This is, and so part of that is for their peers. Uh Yeah, exactly. Part of it's for their peers. Part of it's for, uh, uh, you know, younger practitioners who aspire to be that, right? And they want to kind of know, like, what are the moves I need to make to put myself in that position? Um, And then also interviewing, um, you know, CEOs who are building modern people. Uh, Teams have modern approaches to how they view talent and, and, uh, and, and the role of kind of the people function to kind of shine a light, what's their perspective? Like, what does that look like? Why is it important to them? And so really my aim in all of that, and, and even going deeper than that, my aim in everything I do is to accelerate 
the shift from legacy HR to modern HR. And so the writing, the speaking, the podcasting, the consulting, the search, all of it ties back to that kind of personal mission. And so for me, the podcast is an opportunity to really shine a light on practitioners that deserve a spotlight. They're doing innovative work uh, and, and kind of tell their story because most CHROs, they don't really have a lot of platforms to tell their story. And frankly, it's an insanely demanding job. So like they don't have time exactly you know, either. And so, so that's kind of where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you're creating a canvas for it. I mean, and this is your niche and you're going, you know, an inch wide and a mile deep and you're, and you're giving a platform for these folks to shine, as you said before, that may not have had a chance before. And there's such an appetite for it. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I mean, look, uh, let's be honest. Like I feel really fortunate and lucky because I, I'm a student of the space so I get to indulge my curiosity around like, cool, how did SurveyMonkey did that? Like, how did, how did HubSpot build their, their culture deck? Like, how does, you know, Basecamp approach, you know, recruiting? And these are, these are things I'm innately curious about. So when I get a chance to talk to the executives leading those things, uh, you know, selfishly, yeah. I learn a ton. So it's, it's awesome. great for me. But then the, it's really, I think the flow of the podcast is like me, you know, nerding out, learning about how people do what they do and then letting other people listen to it. Right. So that, that I think is how it, how it comes through. And I think that's why it's helped it connect with an audience because, um, you know, I, I, I had no, uh, I, from the moment I thought I should probably do a podcast, the moment I had the website built and syndicated was 24 hours. I, it, it just, uh, and it so happened, it didn't, it, 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 yeah, it just gained momentum. And I think, uh, I've been really fortunate to have amazing guests with great stories and great, you know, career paths and, uh, and yeah, and it just helped that, uh, podcast find an audience. It's great. I'm like, not, I'm nodding along with you because, you know, I, 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 I'm in 50 plus episodes now and, you know, the caliber of guests like yourself are just growing and I kind of shake my head because I'm, I've created this opportunity where I could just learn immediately from all these people that I, that I value and put it all together. And it's a, it's a collective wealth of information for my audience and for myself selfishly first too. Yeah. Yeah, right? of course. Um, absolutely. So what are, what are some best practices that, that you've been doing to build an audience and, and grow a community around your podcast? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for, I would, uh, I would lie if I could sit here and I could map out like, oh, here's the absolute strategic best practice way. Like, I, I think great guests is one, two, and three yep. uh, on that list. You know, if you find great guests with great stories, um, you know, they have their own audience. Uh, listeners are curious to know, like, what does Reddit do? Or what does Asana do, right? So like, there's an, there, that, that kind of pre-embeds an audience, I think, based on both the speaker and their company. So that certainly helps, um, you know, then outside of that, um, you know, I'll usually, uh, I'll, I'll kind of let the audience know in advance kind of who's upcoming. Um, and, uh, and then I'll, you know, promote it over social. I mean, LinkedIn has really been great uh, as, a, as a, a kind of amplification platform because I'm able to actually have conversations yeah. with listeners on LinkedIn. So I think Community. that's definitely, yeah, that's my most Community engaged audience for the podcast because let's face it, you know, most of, the, most of my audience are um, you know, HR people, practitioners, or executives, or CHROs, uh, or in some cases, um, you know, board and, and kind of you know, core executive levels, uh, people who want to know, like, what's it like to build those teams? How do I go about doing it? Um, and so all of those people are on LinkedIn. That's awesome. And yeah. so when That's I share the audiences. podcast, when I engage, yeah. And so I've had suggestions, you know, from uh, my network on LinkedIn, like, hey, you should really talk to X person, they're doing some really cool stuff here, or like this company did this thing that you should check out. Um, so it really kind of becomes like a collaborative process. They're a part yeah. of the show. I love it, dude. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great show, man. So we're we're a couple weeks away from 2020. What's what's on your radar for the for the new decade? Oh my god, yeah. Um, I'm still trying to wind out this decade. Like I was, uh, I was joking the other day. I, I was like, the last week, I can't shake this vision of an hourglass hanging over me with like the sands kind of dripping through as I'm, and I have this like laundry list of things I'm still trying to get through before this decade ends. So uh, I haven't allowed myself to spend a ton of time on the next decade. Yep. I think the biggest thing is uh, I'm going to be writing a book. So that's going to be a big part of the focus. So I'm probably actually, you know, the, the podcast has been weekly. Um, I'm going to be like, well, I'm definitely gonna be dialing that back to bi-monthly. Um, and I'm even contemplating going Netflix style and doing seasons and batch releasing um, because I'm going to be focused on, uh, you know, a big part of Q1 and Q2 for me is going to be writing. Nice. Um, and so, um, yeah, exactly. So I've got to be mindful. I mean, like I said, you there's, scale there's yourself, all right? other things that I'm working on. So, I mean, you're learning how to scale yourself too, right? We're solopreneurs too. Like our time is finite we, we, and, and it's in demand. I mean, we're not talking just business. We're talking, you know, you got kids, I got kids, 
we got we got priorities there. any any new year's resolutions you're thinking about Lars? No, I don't really believe in those. I mean, yeah. I, I think for I me, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you never keep them and it puts a lot of pressure on yourself. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a new year and I'll be like, these are some things that I, I would like to do this year. Um, but I, I don't go as far as to say resolutions. Cause that just like, to me, that sets yourself up for disappointment. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I, you know, there's enough shit going on. I don't, I don't need to, uh, put an artificial, uh, weight around my neck to get uh, a certain thing done. But, uh, yeah, I, I want to learn how to play the guitar. I wouldn't call it a resolution, but that's uh, 45 I mean, years I've been wanting ambition. to play the guitar. And I think uh, we'll see. Maybe this will be the year I'll, uh, I'll learn a few chords. Just, just pick it up, man. So let's bring it home here. You know, a couple of questions that I ask every guest. I love to get the perspective on these answers. And the first one is, what is the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on daily? Um, you know, actually, uh, the best piece of advice that I got it was actually earlier this year. Um, and I wouldn't say this because I've had, I've been, I've had incredible mentors throughout my career. So I've had a lot of advice. Um, so it's hard for me even to say this is the best, but the one that I think about every day, uh, is, uh, when I started launching, when I created the search practice, um, I had this, you know, I have my own kind of, um, you know, board of directors, if you will. So uh, I would go as far as to say, I do have mentors. This group is kind of separate. It's a, it's a group of within the industry and outside the industry that I go to for ideas and to kind of, you know, gut check me on certain things. And uh, as I was getting ready to launch the search practice, you know, I drafted, a, I'd created a website, I'd created some content collateral around that. And, um, and I was socializing that with some friends. And uh, one of them was like, yeah, this sounds great, but it's not you. And he just checked me on that. He's like, look, you know, you, you, you have a distinct way of viewing the world of talent and recruiting and HR, and you have a distinct voice um, that you are, you're muzzling, you know, with, with framing yourself this way. Like, that's not you. I, I mean, that could be anybody, uh, but you have the special thing to you. And again, he wasn't like blowing smoke at my ass, but he was just like, you know, he's like lean into you. Basically, that was the advice. Lean into you. I love it. Don't, don't, you know, don't try to adjust yourself for a different audience. Um, you know, be, and, and I, it was, it was so profound at that time. Cause I was kind of at a turning point. I mean, you know, creating the search practice, it was like a, somewhat of a reinvention after what I've been doing for a while. And, um, and it was profound and it's informed how I do really everything since where I'm just like, I'm just going to be, I'm going to lean into me and, uh, and Huge the advice. folks, yeah. I mean, the folks that, someone uh, you that, trust. Yeah, exactly. Cause I mean, part of it is too. It's like, I don't, I want, uh, you know, your, your style, your approach, your views, um, they're not going to be for everybody and that's okay. And the idea is like, just like employer branding, you want people to self-select in or out based on how they align. I want to operate the same way. So like, if you, if you appreciate my approach and how I view things in recruiting and talent and, and you want to bring that in your organization, then yeah, let's talk. If, if you don't and you have a different view, cool, let's not talk. Um, but the idea of like leading into you, I think was really profound. That's a big one. You're not going to be everyone's cup of tea all the time. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a broad question, but I'm interested from where you stand right now. You know, what would you say right now is your greatest career accomplishment? Oof. Yeah, I want to be thoughtful in my answer. So let me. Uh, let I me wish I had a, a Jeopardy music button, like automatically, like I could just hit the Jeopardy yeah, right? music button and. <laughs> It's funny, like I, I ask people these questions all the time and, and this one always kind of, everyone takes a pause, a pause on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like honestly, I think, uh, I think looking back, um, probably HR open source, um, I think we were able to impact at a scale. Um, you know, again, I talked about my personal mission of accelerating a shift from legacy HR to modern HR. I think HR always did that at scale. I mean, we had over 8,000 members from over 100 countries. Um, and I'm really proud about um, the impact we had on the industry and really not just the impact that HR open source itself had, but the shift in mindset that it created around like being more open in your practices, sharing, collaborating, because we, we, weren't, we weren't proprietary about that. I didn't care whether you got inspired by HR open source or Google Rework or, or whatever else. Like I just want people to be more open to sharing practices. And I think that's a, that's a real lasting mark that Ambrosia awesome, and I man. and everybody who's involved in the community um, had. So I'm, yeah, I'd say looking back, probably that. That's, that's good stuff. And last but not least, listen, what we do is tough, man. It's a journey. We're dealing with so many X factors and not every day is easy. Professionally, personally, kids get sick, shit happens. Life isn't always sunshine and rainbows. 
And on the other side of it, some days things are going amazing. You know, life is, is, is flowing. Everything's awesome. Your cup is full. Lars, what do you look to to pull you up? What do you look to to show gratitude? Lars Schmidt, what is your North Star? You know, my North Star is my family, uh, honestly. Like for me, it's like I could, I, I've got a home office. I could be in here and I could be, um, uh, suffer a, a, a series of crushing defeats, you know, at, at work or in any of the things that I'm involved with. And I can walk out that door and get a massive hug and a hi daddy and a what, and it just, there's a reset that happens there. It just gives you a perspective that I think, and I'm also, you know, I'm, I'll be 45 next year. I started my family late. So I was, I was, uh, you know, uh, not a dad for a very long time before I came a dad and became a dad. I think that gave me a different just appreciation for being a parent. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, that just, it resets everything. I love it, man. Lars, thanks. Thanks for joining me today, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too, man. It's good to uh, come in and uh, and riff on this. I feel like we, we could go for days. So uh, good yeah, to, we're, uh, we're, we're going to finally get this done. We're we're gonna we're gonna keep it going. And where could folks connect with you? Where they could, where could they find out more? Um, yeah, so the best place, uh, you know, my company website amplifytalent.com, uh, podcast website twenty first century hr dot com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at at Lars, uh, LinkedIn, wherever else. But gonna, uh, those, gonna, those websites and Twitter and LinkedIn are probably the main hubs. Lars Schmidt, thank you for coming on the podcast, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, buddy. Good catching up. Awesome. Absolutely. And everyone listening at home, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Remember, click, link, subscribe, share, all that kind of good stuff. And do what Lars and I both do amazing. Take your online offline. That's, that's the key to success. Make shit happen. Remember, make that happen. Take your online offline. And thank you for joining us and catch us next week on another great episode of the podcast. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode jam-packed with more incredible humans. For more info, please visit www.nhptalentgroup.com.